Fresh cheeses are simply cheeses that are unripened from ricotta to chev, and they can be made with cow, sheep, or goat's milk. I've invited cheesemaker Lynn Fleming to share her knowledge of fresh cheese. Also today, I'm going to make two delectable desserts using fresh cheese, a tarte au fromage, a cannoli cake, plus we have baker Idan Leshnik, and he's here to bake his famous cheesecake babka, all today on Martha Bakes. Baking fresh cheese is something that Lynn Fleming knows very well. In fact, she says it was her love for her goats and their milk that led her to turn her hobby into a business by learning the art of cheese making. Welcome to our show. So Thank happy that you're here. And we have a lot in common. We all, we love goats. <laughs> that we do. And we uh, love making their milk into cheese. Exactly. Yeah. So these are all your cheeses? They are. Where do you sell all these cheeses? We sell primarily to people at farmer's markets. We do farmer's markets in New York City and upstate New York as well. Well, I just tasted the ricotta. I tasted this delicious marinated chev ball. I had never had a chev ball before. Yeah. So good. And I would love to taste all of these, and I'm, I'm going to before the show is over, but how did you get involved in making cheese like this? Uh, well, I had the goats. and uh, What kind and of goats? We have Nubians and La Manchas. And what do La Manchas look like? La Manchas have no external ears. So. How weird, because Nubians yeah. have big, long ears. Exactly. Floppy ears. And when we cross the two, we get little, tiny elf ears. Oh. So. How hard is it to turn their milk into cheese? It's not hard. We make cheese on Sunday, Monday, and Wednesday during the week, and we sell it at market on the weekend. Uh, every I weekend. have a need to feed a lot of goats, and yeah. that does the job. And uh, what do goats eat? We feed uh, hay 365 days a year. We're on small acreage in New York, and we don't have a lot of browse, but they have access to browse. And then we do feed some grain. So browse is pasture? Browse is pasture. Well, they don't like to eat what they walk on. Oh, I so see. So browse are more the rose briars, the, yes. yeah, anything. Oh, I have acres of that. You want to bring your goats down? Absolutely. They could clear my woods for me. <laughs> they would do it in a second, wouldn't they? Yes, they do a very good job. <laughs> so how much milk do you get per goat per day? About a gallon a day on average. Some uh -huh. of the older does will make more and the younger does less, but about a gallon a day on average. How many milkers? We milk about 130 to 150. I think we're at 130 today. So 130 gallons of milk a day. How many pounds of cheese would that make? This time of year, we're pushing, it's fall, we're pushing um, two pounds per gallon. So we could theoretically make 260 pounds in a right. day. Wow. Some, we are still feeding some babies. We have to have our milk for our babies yes, as well. Yes, of course. What's in here? This is a ricotta curd that we made. It's the same as basically what's in here before it's been drained. Oh, I see. So this so gets drained in, in gets a strainer? Drained, exactly, in a cheesecloth and a strainer. And then that would become the ricotta that we bring to market. I, I just tasted this. It is so fresh and so tasty. It was made and yesterday with milk that uh, came out of the goats yesterday. Oh, actually. how beautiful. How beautiful. So it's really impeccably fresh. What's the difference between this and cow's milk ricotta? Just the taste? I would imagine the fat content as well. Yeah, Less fat in the goat? In the goat, yeah. Less fat. And what's in here? This is milk. Uh -huh. We could make ricotta. Um, oh, it has to be hot, hot? It has to be hot. And then you add what to it? Vinegar. Oh, I see. The white vinegar and a bit of salt. And then it curdles, and we have the curd, and we strain it to make oh. the ricotta. And goat feta. Now that looks good. You make loaves of that? We make bags, actually. We oh. bag them, which is why they have unique shapes. So. Every bag and every shape and every cut is unique. We just cut them to, to the proper weight to package them. Oh boy, this is good. Thanks. Very tasty. Mm. Can I try the pepper? Sure. That I would like on a little piece of bread. So what are some of your favorite recipes incorporating your cheeses? Oh, we just like to eat them on a cracker, of course, but I love to put it, put it over hot drained pasta. Uh, Throw in a little chicken or shrimp. It's a meal in the time it takes to cook the pasta. Oh, that's a good idea. So that's always one that's a favorite mm. when we use a lot of Oh, that's so good. Thanks. How do you make that? We pasteurize the milk. We cool it to a temperature. We add culture. And then it sets for a while. It's a lactic acid curd, so it just takes a little time. It's a very delicate curd. And then after it's been sitting long enough, we strain it for 12 to 24 hours, depending on the firmness that we want. 
and then we hand roll every one of these logs. They're oh, all hand rolled. Oh, it's hand rolled. And then you roll the logs into the various flavors. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, I have to come up and see your goats and see your operation. I'd love to see it. I'd love to show them to you. And the farm is where? In Pinebush, New York. Congratulations. You make beautiful cheeses. Thank you very much. And it's so nice to learn about how it's done. Thank you very much for bringing this wide selection of product to us. Thanks for having me. If you're a fan of New York cheesecake, you're going to love Tarte au Fromage. It is the French version of cheesecake from the northeast corner of France, known as Alsace. My first step is making the pâte brisée crust. Two and a half cups of all-purpose flour, a teaspoon of salt, a teaspoon of sugar, and I like to Make this in the food processor. We've tried making it by hand. It takes much, much less time to do it in a food processor like this. So easy. And two sticks, half a pound of chilled unsalted butter cut into small pieces so that it is ready just to put into the flour mixture. You can hear how cold it is. It's very cold. Also have your ice water ready quarter of a cup, maybe a little bit more if it's a very dry day. Now process very quickly until the butter is, we always say like oatmeal, and then add your water, pulsing, that should do it. And the way you can tell is by squeezing it like that, it holds together nicely. So there's our dough. This gives you enough for two tarts or one double crust pie. Wrap well in discs and chill the dough a couple hours or overnight. We have one already chilled and then roll until you have a large round of pastry to fit into your nine and a half inch by two inch round fluted tart pan. One reason I love these French rolling pins is that I can easily do this. What I like about this is that to have the little excess is I fold it down a little bit, make a ridge about halfway down the ring just to give a little bit more sturdiness to the sides of the crust. Work quickly so your pastry does not get warm. Now you can use your thumb to take off the excess and chill in the freezer for about one hour. So now we're going to blind bake our beautiful crust. If you do not line it with paper and wait, the crust will sometimes collapse. These are beans that I've used for years and years and years, the same beans. They just bake and cool, get placed back in the storage jar. You can buy pie weights if you like, but you just use a pound or two of beans that you have. So this goes right into a preheated oven at 375 degrees and bake until the crust is gold in about 30 minutes. Then you lift the parchment out and bake until the crust is a light golden brown. That takes about 10 minutes more. So here is the crust. See what a wonderful color. And it did not shrink very much. That's because it was blind baked and it is high enough to hold the entire filling that I'm going to make right now. This is the fromage part of the tarte au fromage. So we have 18 ounces of farmer's cheese mixed with two thirds of a cup of creme fraiche. Farmer's cheese is really a fine version of cottage cheese. And it has, um, it's a little bit saltier and um, it is pressed and drier. Creme fraiche is heavy cream with a little bit of buttermilk added to thicken it naturally. One egg yolk goes into this cheese mixture and we have a quarter of a teaspoon of salt into our cream. One and a half teaspoons of good vanilla. That is important. It should be vanilla extract of the highest quality. Then don't forget one tablespoon plus a teaspoon of melted butter. So that is our cheese. And to this, we're going to add one cup of sugar mixed with one tablespoon plus one teaspoon of all-purpose flour. Flour will help thicken the filling just enough so that it has body. And then you mix the sugar with the cheeses. Now, 
That would be more like the filling of a New York cheesecake. But the French decided to add this to a frothy meringue. And that's what makes this light and airy and delicious. Four egg whites in your bowl of the mixer and a third of a cup of sugar. Takes about four minutes for the glossy peaks to form, so be patient. There you have soft peaks. You can release the bowl from the mixer and fold half of the egg whites into your cheese mixture. And then the rest. Preheat your oven, by the way, at this point to 375 degrees. This tart takes about 45 to 55 minutes to bake. Place the filling into the shell. And it'll be very different from the cheesecake you're used to. Once out of the oven, let the tart cool, and then you can unmold it onto your serving dish. No need to choose between cheesecake and a tart. This astonishing tart has it all. Enjoy. If you like cannoli, and who doesn't like cannoli, you're going to love my dazzling layer cake based on this beloved Sicilian-style confection. I've simplified this version by sandwiching the filling with crispy layers of something you might already have in your freezer, puff pastry. It's a good thing to have on hand. So we need three rounds of puff pastry, and I'm using this eight inch bowl as my guide for the circle. And put the round right on a piece of parchment to bake and cut your third round. Any leftover pastry like this you can save, of course. You could put it back in the freezer, but make some cheese straws. Make some palmier for your children. Children love the crispy, sugary layers of palmier. So now, what is going to keep these from just rising and kind of getting out of shape? A simple solution, using a baking rack like this, Put that diagonally upside down right over the puff. The puff will reach the level of the grid and not rise any taller than that. So these go right into a preheated 400 degree oven. Bake for 10 minutes, remove the rack, and then bake for 20 minutes more. This is the filling to go between our puff pastry. One and three quarters cup of ricotta cheese plus two tablespoons a half a cup of confectioner's sugar, half a teaspoon of vanilla, and a quarter of a teaspoon of salt, and a quarter of a teaspoon of cinnamon. Fold that in, and that looks good. And three ounces of very finely chopped semi-sweet chocolate. Fold that in. And we have three ounces of finely chopped candied orange peel. I thought the orange and the chocolate would go nicely together. That looks good. And then to lighten it all even more, fold in a half a cup of heavy cream, which is whipped till it forms stiff peaks. Just fold that in. Adds a nice flavor and additional fluffiness. So there you have your filling. So now just Put this in the refrigerator until your layers are done, at least two hours. So it's been 10 minutes. Let's see how our puff is doing. See, they've risen absolutely evenly, and they are a nice, even height. Now you can just take this rack off and put them back into the oven for another 20 minutes until they're a golden brown. Look how beautiful these are. Golden brown, sides, tops, and bottom. Sprinkle liberally with confectioner's sugar through a sieve. Do this powdered sugar on each of the three rounds. Now this goes right back into your oven, set now on broil because you want to crunch between the layers. It takes no longer than three minutes. Look how beautifully glazed the top is. Let the layers cool and then the decorating. These are Sicilian pistachios. The bright, bright green is natural. It is not artificial. 
such a beautiful color. And these trees that make these pistachios have been growing in the foothills of Mount Etna in eastern Sicily for hundreds of years. The quality of these particular nuts is known throughout Italy. And now we are getting them in the United States to enjoy in all their glory. I'm painting the edges of our cannoli cakes with this beautiful semi-sweet chocolate melted. And we're going to roll the edges in the pistachios. Pretty, right? It's such a colorful and beautiful pastry. And proceed with the other layers in the same fashion. And then we'll fill the cake. So I have my cold filling, and this is a half cup scoop, and we need three of these between each of the two layers that we're filling. And just very carefully spread the filling on that very delicate cannoli layer. Faux cannoli, I'm calling it, because it really is not the same as a cannoli roll would be made out of. So here's layer number one. And of these two layers, I think that's the prettiest. That will be the top. This will be the second layer. And pull it out almost to the edge. I've centered the cake on this very pretty opaque glass cake stand. Looks sort of retro. But cannolis are kind of retro. I remember as a child enjoying these at my next door neighbors in the Allegri kitchen. They were great cooks, the Allegri's. This one centered right here. And present this to your friends and tell them that is the new fangled cannoli. Feel free, of course, to try other candied fruits and spices to make this dazzling dessert your very own. Enjoy. The Don Leshnik is here to teach us how to master the art of babka making. So what does the addition of, of ricotta cheese in this recipe do for the recipe? And ricotta, being a lighter cheese as compared to the cream cheese, lightens up that filling just enough to, to give that freshness into the, every bite. So let's start with the recipe, the dough okay. first, of course. Yes, dough first always. Okay, what can I do? I would like um, for you to actually pound the butter okay. and create a butter packet. Okay. In the meantime, I'll start mixing our dough. So I'm using three quarters cup of milk, and I'm using whole milk in this case. If I make too much noise, just tell me. <laughs> now I'll use two large eggs. So it's three quarters of a pound yes. of butter. I'll add half a teaspoon of salt. If this is too distracting, please tell me. No, I'm used to this sound. This, is, this sound keeps me alive. Half a cup of sugar. So in this case, I'm using half and half of all-purpose and pastry flour, two and a quarter cups of each one. And what I found is the use of pastry flour really helps us get some more extensibility. Even those heavy-duty, beautiful rolling pins are going to be hard to roll out a dough. If it were just all-purpose flour. Exactly. So um, what's the difference between all-purpose and uh, so pastry? The protein content in pastry flour is a lot lower, uh, meaning that the gluten development would take a longer time to develop and is a little weaker in general. All right, flour. And I'll add three tablespoons of fresh yeast and eight and a half tablespoons of unsalted butter cut into cubes. I'll clean up after you. Yeah, I know I'm a mess. All right. So as this is going, we can fold this butter up a little okay. bit. What I found um, laminating these doughs is that if you give the butter an actual fold, the way a dough is folded, it creates a more pliable butter. Ah, so you're making a neat little packet. Yes. There we go. Lovely. We're just gonna chill this in the refrigerator for two hours. So this should almost be done. My mom used to make babka, but never using a machine. She did it all in by hand in a yeah. great big yellow bowl. And I have to uh, respect that. That's, yeah. That demands a lot more than using a mixer or anything right. else. That is good to go. Great. So we can wrap this up in some plastic film. And get that also into the refrigerator? Yes, so this is gonna rest again for between two hours to an overnight. Okay, so this goes here and here. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. 
So I'll make the simple streusel, which is four tablespoons of unsalted butter at room temperature, three quarters of a cup plus one tablespoon of flour, and five tablespoons of sugar. Yes. I'm gonna make the cheese filling in the okay. meantime. So I have one cup of cream cheese and a quarter cup plus one tablespoon of fresh ricotta. I'll add a little bit of cornstarch, one and a half tablespoons, half a cup of powdered sugar, plus one tablespoon, and a half an egg. A half an egg? Half an egg. That's about a half. Perfect. That looks great. And as this is mixing, we can zest some lemon. Do you want me to scrape the vanilla bean? Yes, please. That's a lot of seeds. Yeah. I love seeing how the vanilla beans disperse. Okay, and that's done. So this is gonna have to be refrigerated overnight as well. We wanna let those flavors work into each other and create an even stronger aroma. So now it's time to laminate the butter into the dough. Yep. So what I like to do is just fold over the dough in a way that locks in this butter and, and allows us to, to roll it out. So I use the, the palm of my hand and actually pound it just really lightly. What this does, it locks in the butter into the dough. Um, I fold the dough right over. So we have our dough packet. Um, and now one more time, I'm just gonna press it. So I just continue rolling this out until it reaches the desired thickness. Which is what? About six millimeters. Uh, like a third of an inch? A third of an inch? Yeah, it looks like yeah. something like that. Okay, so at this point, we're gonna give it a double fold, or what we call a book fold. So I start off with the long end. You want these two ends to meet. At this point, we're gonna give it one okay. more fold like that. So what we get is basically four alternating yes. layers. Okay. Um, and now this process is gonna be repeated. I'm gonna stretch out the dough one more time. I'm gonna give it another book fold or double fold. And we'll reserve this in the fridge for two hours. And then we can work with it. So we have to wrap that again? Yes. Okay. So at this point, roll this out to 27 inch by nine inch, and then just cut it right in half. We're gonna make three babkas, and each babka has two strands. At this point, we can fill them with the cheesecake babka filling. So we have some piping bags. All I'm gonna do is basically pipe a strip of cheesecake filling. On each? On each one. Okay. Very that pretty great. filling. Yeah, that looks great. So what we'll do now is just create these tubes. So we'll just pinch the ends, and envelop this cheese. And I'm just gonna alternate two of these strands in an X shape and twist. Oh, pretty. Yes. Put this in the tin? Of course. And these are oiled or buttered? These are oiled. At this point, we're gonna have to let this rise. So that's gonna take about two hours to rise. The cloth allows the babkas to breathe as they're proofing okay. without drying them. And we have some that are already risen, we like have. magic. Yes. So at this stage, we'll brush some egg. This is the half egg that we used earlier. Oh, good. And I'm just lightly brushing the top. This gives a really nice shine to it and allows us also to stick the streusel that we made. Just yeah, spray so the low? As much as you'd like. So um, into a 350? 350, 350 um, for approximately 50 to 60 minutes. What we're looking for is a really nice golden shine to it. So these have cooled for 10 minutes. They're already cool enough, right? Yep. So you do the honors of sprinkling. <laughs> I do like to leave a little bit of the color of the crust. I do too. When you pull this out of the oven, you are going to thank Edom for this amazing cheese babka. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank all of you for watching. I'll see you on the next episode of Martha Bakes. I love using aromatic flavors in my baking. Citrus zest is one of those ingredients that can pack a big flavor to any recipe. Zesting some citrus, I'm rubbing some sugar with that citrus in order to extract those oils and flavor to its fullest. Another great idea, heat up heavy cream, pour it over the orange zest, and you have a delicious orange zest cream. Another great solution is I just boiled equal parts sugar and water, add some lemon zest. This really mellows out our pastries and mellows out the sweetness, so you should give it a try.